Hi, welcome to Amazing Grace Online. Glad you're here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for stopping by. We are currently in the study called the Gospel of Mark. Today's lesson is lesson number two, and we're going to be covering Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 13. If you didn't catch the first uh, part of our study, it would be the introduction to Mark. And we set some introductory features uh, that we unfold and look at the, the, who wrote the Gospel of Mark. We looked at Mark's unique qualities uh, compared to the other Gospels and how, they're, uh, how the message is the same, of course, but from a different angle and so forth. So great consideration in that first lesson. So please uh, look for that on our YouTube channel. You'll find it at Amazing Grace Church St. Paul. And we have all of our videos located there. So you can pick up that one from last week or even tune into another one. Well, as we begin here today, I want to encourage you to download our study guide from agstpaul.com and you will find it under this week's Bible study. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time as we come together. Our Father God, thank you for bringing us together today. And we ask the Lord that you would help us to comprehend your word in a manner that gives us more awe for you and and what you've done for us, Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for the, the encouragement of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's begin here by reading the first 13 verses of Mark chapter 1. It says, The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah, the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the desert. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sin. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come the one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love with you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. Well, as we begin here today, our first question, read Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. We're going to look at how does Mark introduce his gospel. A couple things to note, few things. First of all, Mark uses the word arche. If that word sounds familiar, it means beginning. We get our word archaeology or archaeology. What that means is the study of the beginning. Arche means beginning. And Mark is not alone in using this word. He's, uh, he's also uh, joining John in using the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. That's how John begins his book. Well, Mark uses this uh, word, to connect that his book is a new beginning in which God reveals the good news of Jesus Christ. The second thing is Mark introduces the word gospel, meaning good news. So the good news of the gospel. And Mark is really the one who put gospel on the radar as far as introducing the good news of Jesus Christ. So Mark uh, really ramped this up, the use of the term gospel to describe the good news of Jesus. Another thing, Mark introduces Jesus as the Son of God, right there in his uh, beginning of, the, of his writing. It says that the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Finally, Mark brings in two Old Testament references concerning prophetic validation, referring to Jesus. And Mark notes that it's Isaiah. But uh, really, it's the prophets, in, including Isaiah. The first one is Malachi chapter 3, 1, and then Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Some versions of the Bible say, the, as it is written in the prophets. Uh, the NIV translates it as Isaiah. Well, another thing to consider is that verse 1 seems to be a title for the book. 
This, infer this verse unfolds throughout the entire Gospel of Mark. And just read that. It says the beginning of the Gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That really sounds like a book title, doesn't it? Well, Mark takes and uses that first verse and unfolds how this happens. And so he shares with us all the, the proof of Jesus as the Son of God. Our question number two, in verse two, Mark uses the expression, as it is written. What does the use of this expression convey? Well, a couple things here. It conveys, first of all, the authoritative character of the Old Testament, that God's word has authority. And here Mark is using that here as saying, as it is written, referring to the prophets, uh, as it is written, this is authoritative. The second thing is Mark uses the prophetic references not only to validate Jesus, but also to validate the ministry of John the Baptist, that this is a prophetic word concerning the forerunner of Jesus that would come on the scene to introduce uh, the Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God. Question number three, how does Mark introduce John? This is seen in verses four to five. Well, first of all, we see that he introduces him as one who came baptizing in the wilderness. Uh, we'll talk about the word wilderness here. The, the word wilderness is eremos, and it describes a solitary, lonely, or desolate, or uninhabited place. Uh, not necessarily a hot climate like we would call a desert, but it's, it's basically a desolate or lonely place out in kind of, we call it the boondocks. These are un, uninhabited places, and this is, where Mark, uh, this is where Mark introduces John. Well, the wilderness or the desert is a place of a reminder for Israel's disobedience. Uh, back in Joshua chapter 5, verse 6, the here's what this says. It says the Israelites had moved about in the desert 40 years until all men who were of military age when they left Egypt had died since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see that land until he had solemnly promised their fathers to give, to give us a land flowing with milk and honey. Well, the wilderness here was a place of disobedience. But God sent John into the wilderness as kind of like a, a fresh start. So it, it actually, the wilderness is becoming a place of redemption as God raised up John to prepare the way for Jesus. So it's interesting to see that. So uh, the word wilderness or desert has significant meaning for, for Jewish people. That it's in that desert that God uh, led the people and provided for them. It was also a place of of disobedience, but God also made it a place of redemption. Question number four, what is significant about how John was dressed? That gives, Mark chapter one, verse six, gives us a description of what John's wearing here. Well, here he is dressed as a typical holy man of the Middle East. In fact, he's dressed just like Elijah. We have a reference out of 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 8 that really uh, gives a description of how Elijah the prophet dressed. And the reference is a hairy man wearing a leather belt around his waist. And they said it's Elijah the Tishbite. Well, here John the Baptist comes on the scene as a prophet. It's a direct correlation between Elijah and John the Baptist. Well, question number five, what was John's baptism? that he was preaching. Well, it says here in our scriptures that John was preaching a, a baptism of repentance. It was a repentance baptism. Repentance means a deliberate turning from sin. So the baptism occurred following the repentance of sin. And this actually, you know, baptisms were common back in this time as people who would come, they were converting to Judaism, they would have a, a ceremonial baptism of conversion to that. So uh, John is out baptizing, a uh, baptism of repentance. Now this is different from uh, a believer's baptism. And the Christian baptism is an identification with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. We read about that in Romans chapter 6. Well, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. It was a, a, a way of people getting ready for Jesus to come, all right? The first time that he, of his coming, all right? So number six, what place did John the Baptist take in relation to Jesus Christ? Well, verses seven and eight, 
uh, really define this, that John took the place as a forerunner or one who would announce the, the, the coming of Jesus. He would uh, announce the arrival. And he said, someone more powerful than I will come after me. So he said, somebody mightier than I. And John demonstrated humility in saying, I'm not worthy to untie the straps of his sandals, indicating that this one who is coming is so great that uh, John saw himself as one who is not even worthy to untie uh, the Messiah's shoes. John also distinguished baptisms. His baptism um, was a, a, a baptism of repentance. The one that Jesus was in, would introduce, uh, John says this, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So John distinguishes even the, the baptisms that would come. Question number seven, why was Jesus baptized by John? And how is this description of Jesus' baptism different from Matthew's? Uh, we can compare Mark chapter 1, 9, cross-reference that with Matthew chapter 3, verse 14. And so let's look at this first. Well, Jesus was baptized in keeping with the entire mission on earth. And he, he came to identify with sinful man. He himself is sinless or was sinless when he came. Jesus committed no sins, so he had no reason to um, confess sins because he never sinned. He was baptized to identify with sinful man, that he came as the sin bearer. Matthew records that John tried to deter Jesus. He said, I need to be baptized by you and you come to me for baptism? In other words, he's saying, you don't need to be baptized. I need to be baptized by you. G um, John understood that Jesus is who he said he is. But uh, this is how Matthew brings it out, that John really didn't want to baptize. Mark kind of just goes through and says, well, he's identifying with, with man here. Well, number eight, what three things happened when Jesus came up out of the water? Why is this so significant? We read this in verses 10 through 11. Let's note these things. The first thing that we see, the heavens were torn open. And that kind of gives us a, a picture of this violent opening of the heavens. And f after that happened, B, the Spirit descended like a dove. Okay, so it's the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. And we know that in creation, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And here we see, uh, once again, the Spirit of God which is the Holy Spirit, he's described as like a dove coming. And see, a voice from heaven, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That was the voice of the Father. Well, here's, this is significant because this is a clear display of the Trinity or the triunity of God. We see here God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all right here. I think that's pretty fascinating, isn't it? Well, question number nine, as you read Mark's account of the temptation of Jesus, what is different about Mark's account from Matthew and Luke's accounts? Mark chapter 1, verses 12 to 13. Well, Mark's account of the temptation of Jesus is very brief. We only have two verses. Matthew uh, devotes 11 verses and Luke devotes 13 verses. Mark mentions no specific temptations, and he doesn't describe Jesus' victory over the devil's temptations. Mark emphasizes that Jesus' entire ministry was a continuing conflict with the devil. Victory would come by way of the cross and the resurrection that we read about in Mark chapter 16. Well, we see that it's a constant struggle, uh, good versus evil. Question number 10, what is the symbolic reference to Jesus in the number 40? Well, the number 40 is specific here. For the Jewish people, they would understand the significance of 40. It was 40 years in the desert. Uh, there's a reference to Moses in 40 days, and that's in Exodus chapter 24, 18. And Moses uh, was the deliverer of God's people. God raised Moses up. And we see that Jesus is the deliverer of God's people. He's the final deliverer, and he goes to the desert for 40 days. So there's a, a reference there. We also have Elijah the prophet, in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 8, he was in the wilderness for 40 days. And so here's what we see is there's a reference to both Moses and Elijah and the number 40. Our final question, question 11, 
Mark chapter 1, 1 to 13, reveals four witnesses, each testifying to the identity of Jesus as the Son of God. What are the four witnesses? The first witness that we see is that Mark said that Jesus is the Son of God. So Mark is the witness here to hearing this. And we find that Mark wrote his gospel uh, with a lot of information from Peter. And we looked at how Mark, or how Acts chapter 10, uh, the 36 to 42, that Peter's sermon provides really an outline here for Mark. And so uh, even though Mark uh, was not a disciple as mentioned as the 12, one of the original 12 disciples, he was a follower of Christ. And we hear about him being there in the garden and we talked about that last week. But Mark is a witness that Jesus is the Son of God. And so he's our first witness. Our second witness is B, the prophets. The prophets said that Jesus is Lord. And that, that came from Mark chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, the references to Malachi and Isaiah. The third witness is John the Baptist, because John the Baptist said, one is, who is mightier than I is coming. And the fourth witness is God the Father himself. He said, Jesus, Jesus is uh, my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so this is how Mark introduces his gospel. And we end with uh, this last question because we summarize the four witnesses that point to Jesus as the Son of God so that Jesus is who he said he is. So it wasn't just one witness, it was four witnesses we see. Well, thanks for joining us today. I know this time goes quick here, but I want to encourage you that the questions that we ask are kind, they're related to the scriptures and we're, we're kind of unfolding some things to think about. But what is God's spirit putting in your heart? Uh, how, does, how, does, how does Mark chapter 1, 1 to 13, how does that impact your faith? And are you seeing Jesus in a greater light as you study these scriptures? And it's my prayer that as we go through these scriptures each week, that we... Uh, not only write the answers on the piece of paper, but we really are encouraged in our hearts and really understand who Jesus is. Because this man was passionate about writing down uh, his good news to share uh, with, like, with people like us so long um, after he wrote this. So I hope you walk away with some encouragement uh, from tonight's study. Well, let's close in prayer. Father God, thank you for being with us. And Holy Spirit, we ask that as we have read these first 13 verses, that we will uh, consider them in greater detail and look them over and, and read them again and again and really tap into who Jesus is and how Jesus is introduced in the Gospel of Mark. And Lord, we pray that we can share with others the good news of Jesus and point them to the Gospel of Mark. Thank you, Lord, for our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, our next lesson is lesson number three, and we're going to be covering a longer portion, Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 45. So I would encourage you to read on ahead, uh, 14 to 45, for next week, and uh, we'll pick it up then. Well, until, until then, you have a great day, a great rest of the day, and a great week. See you next time.